Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Take a 20-minute, really 28-minute walk in Manhattan and learn about gentrification, Washington Square Park, Grid's loathsome landlords, brain scans of London cabbies, Le Cabousier, Jane Jacobs, garbage disposal diplomacy, Disneyfication, and lethal tidiness, and a lot more. Stay tuned. Leading on this stroll through Manhattan is Michael Sorkin, Distinguished Professor of Architecture and Director of the Graduate Program in Urban Design at CUNY's City College. He is the author of 20 Minutes in Manhattan. He has been the Professor and Director of the Institute for Urbanism at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, and he lectures widely. He is the author of 17 books, several hundred articles on architectural and urban subjects. For 10 years, he was the architectural critic of the Village Voice, he is also the president of Terraform, a nonprofit engaged in urban research and advocacy, as well as the president of the Institute for Urban Design. And he is the principal in Michael Sorkin Studios. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. This was a great tour, this 20 minutes. In fact, it took me several hours, and then the research took me several, several more hours. And literally, this is a course. Congratulations. But like The Village, this book is full of serendipity and surprises. Talk to the, your feeling of the city. What, what should a great city be? You're a lover of cities, and you're a critic of much of what goes on. What makes a great city? Well, certainly one of the things that makes a great city is serendipity and surprises. Uh, I think I probably say somewhere in the book that I think about cities as being juxtaposition machines, um, uh, places that engender all sorts of encounters between people and space, between people and people, between people and dogs, uh, between spaces and spaces. Uh, and each of these encounters um, is a formulation of what the city is and what the city mm -hmm. means. And the accumulation of such encounters in all their diversity, weirdness, and surprise, uh, I think constitutes the soul of the city. What, what, uh, this, this is a multifaceted answer, I know. What is, what do you find wrong with the way the city has developed in terms of its architecture, its life, its urbanity? Uh, well, I've spent a large part of a career uh, <laughs> no, noting, you some, have to it no, noting some of these deficiencies. Um, I, I would say that if, if there is one thing that I have noticed, uh, having lived in the city for Let's not go into that, but uh, 40 years, uh, is uh, the growth of the income gap. Um, you know, the, 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 the reconstitution of New York uh, as a center of privilege, um, the resegregation of many neighborhoods uh, um, in, in favor of, you know, we, we speak about gentrification, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, 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 it's a serious matter. Um, you know, over the time that I've been living in New York and certainly observing New York, um, our powers uh, as an industrial city have ebbed. Um, new forms of um, uh, production, quote unquote, uh, you know, the the invention of um, various derivatives by Goldman Sachs, you know, have become too much of the creative enterprise of the city. And I think that all sorts of things are slighted uh, in this shift. You know, we 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 now have. Um, you know, the richest census tract and the poorest census tract uh, in the country within a mile of each other. Uh, and this seems to me to suggest a, a, a failure on the part of uh, city administrations and uh, the public. Let's, let's talk about that. Mike Bloomberg has talked about New York as a luxury city. This seems to fly directly in the face of the city that you envision. And, and in fact, have lived in it at various points. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to romanticize poverty, but uh, I do um, believe with all my heart that cities should be open, that cities should be diverse. We just had a, Sharon Zukin and I, Sharon, who also teaches here, just had right. a, a mocking review in the uh, Atlantic magazine um, in which um, 
the idea of mixed use and diversity are referred to in inverted commas by the author uh, as somehow sentimental ideas. Yeah, you know, nostalgic. Nostalgic. It seems to me that these are core values of decent urbanity, mixed use and diversity. And I think that to the degree that New York is successful, it is because it represents a mix of uses and peoples. But the but the author here talks about this these these moments as being on a knife edge. The the these uh, visions of urbanity, Jane Jacobs' death and life in the early nineteen sixties. But in, in a sense, Jacobs' vision, in some sense, failed because of the very success of her vision that it became such an attractive place that it drew in people with money. And as those people came in, they drove out the people who made it interesting in the first place. And you have this spiral where you come to what, what, what you obviously are not comfortable with, and, and I, I would almost say loathe, is gentrification. Yeah. Well, I, you know, gentrification, I think, cuts in a number of ways. Go ahead. Um, one of them is um, we, we, we tend to make a, 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 a confusing mistake in associating gentrification too much with its physical effects and not enough with its social effects. So I am all for the preservation of the historic fabric, and to the degree that new residents of neighborhoods, including Jane Jacobs, uh -huh. uh, who uh, this review accuses of being a gentrifier, uh, you know that that new populations, new citizens, the city is constantly, uh, whoops, the city is constantly being refreshed um, by the arrival of new populations. Before this. Uh, uh, on air session, we were chatting in the green room uh, about your having taken kids on the number seven train. Right. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the miracles of New York. Is this is, this is a, a, a section through the city, to use architectural language, that embraces speak people speaking 110 languages, right. whatever it is, right. and reveals, you know, this constant influx of new populations with new skills and new sensibilities and new cultures. I mean, this is this this is part of the genius. So the problem with gentrification is um, the way in which it systematically represses the possibility of diversity. To the degree that it is a strategy for taking poor neighborhoods and converting them into rich neighborhoods, never mind the fate of the original inhabitants, right. it's a bad thing. To the, to the degree that it can be uh, uh, a force for um, saving the, the, the architecture, mm -hmm. preserving the texture, um, the scale, a lot of the morphological things that Jane Jacobs mm -hmm. talks about, this is, this, is, this is a positive thing. Um, you know, one, one of the, the passages in the book is, is about um, rent control. And we were also talking about the fact that I have uh, benefited from stabilization. Yes, and you make a, a very interesting argument about rent control. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that the rent, rent control is, is um, completely vital to the, to the possibility of a diverse city. Um, you know, one of Jacob's arguments is precisely that a neighborhood um, should be able to embrace uh, all of its citizens um, and should provide opportunities for people of different, uh, are we allowed to say class anymore, mm -hmm. of different social classes, um, different sensibilities, different professions, different outlooks. Um, and people need to be protected nowadays against the market, which in, in its cruelties and myopia, uh, tends to look at uh, real estate prices as the only descriptor uh, of value in the city. And if, you know, if, if, if I have a beef with uh, Mike Bloomberg, um, it is that he tends to see this bottom line uh, as the primary measure of urban success. And I'm, I'm afraid that we need to um, interfere with the market a little bit if we believe that the idea of a diverse, mixed, a uh, friendly, hospitable city is is of value to us. You know, just as we interfere with the the big market uh, in bailing out the banks. And, and Talk about the city planning commission and what it does and doesn't do. I mean, is is it is it part of a solution or is it the problem, or uh, is it neither? Obviously, yeah, I don't think it's it's quite so black and white. I mean, it's an interesting moment. I mean, I, in in the in the city uh, right now. Um, you know, for, for all his for, faults, um, Bloomberg has appointed some very good people uh, in city government. The, you know, the Department of Design and Construction mm -hmm. is led by somebody extremely enlightened. We have an almost miraculous uh, commissioner of uh, the Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. uh, the person who's responsible for the closure of Times Square, you know, 400 miles of bike paths. Uh, it has a very sensible outlook about public transportation. Jeanette Sadek Khan. Go ahead. Uh, Jeanette Sadek Khan, yeah. And... Um, and uh, the city 
the City Planning Commission is um, slightly, slightly more problematic. Um, and the, the question arises, um, they have been doing a massive rezoning. Right. And, you know, as with all such matters, the, who, the question is who benefits. Um, uh, there has been a recent study um, that suggests, uh, out of NYU, that suggests that um, all this rezoning has not resulted in any net gain in uh, housing numbers, mm -hmm. um, which may be neither here nor there, although the mayor is quite vocal in talking about the likelihood of adding a million to the population of the city. Um, I'm not persuaded this will necessarily take place, nor that it's necessarily a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, seems to me, and again, um, I would want to do much more careful analysis, that the, um, the um, City Planning Commission is um, doing good things in terms of its recognition of the importance of architecture and design. Right. You know, we're, we're, we're all in favor of that. Um, but I suspect that the main impact of the rezonings that are taking place are essentially to protect um, property values uh, rather than to stimulate the growth of um, of uh, housing for a, a more diverse population. You are the planning czar. Mm. You've been named the planning czar. What What do you do? What What's your first actions as planning czar for New York? Um, well, I, I think that uh, it's important to sort of split it up. Uh, again, the, the the impetus, yeah, I'm an architect, so my, mm -hmm. my, my impetus is to, would be to do physical things. Okay. But I think that the defense of the rent laws um, is probably the most important thing a, a planning czar mm. might, might think about doing, and perhaps even extending the rent laws to um, some commercial properties. On the other hand, it, you know, if I were in charge of the physical city, yes. um, which, you know, I, I, of course, long to be, you know, of houseman dreams, um, I would immediately take half of the street space of New York and turn it back over to the pedestrian realm. Um, you know, I, I am uh, outraged every morning when I walk up and uh, cruise that's down what the I, block. No, excuse huh? me, that's what I loved about the book. I, you uh, wake up outraged. I wake up outraged, exactly. And, uh, yeah. Then I have my first cup that, of that's, coffee. That's, yeah. I, I know the feeling well. well I, okay. Uh, but let me tell you Go what, ahead. one of the things that, I, a number of things that outrage me. You Go know, ahead. I, Go. I, I, you know. Setting aside the derelict condition of the hallways of my building, uh, which is a, which is and a, which is another and story. And the stairway and your loathsome landlords. But Go I, ahead. I proceed down the stoop and I observe a couple of things. One of them is that two lanes of my little street, which is four lanes wide in toto, are given over to the storage of private automobiles. You know, so maybe there are 30 cars. All this street space given over so 30 people Public can park. space. Public space, that's right. Streets are the largest area of public space under municipal control. And, and to, to use them to, in, in essence, subsidize this doomed transportation technology is, out, is outrageous to me. So I say, let us take these lanes back. Let us plant trees and deal with the, uh, the urban heat island effect and sequester CO2 and produce architecture. Let us uh, install uh, garages for our bicycles. Let us deal with the other outrage, which is our ridiculous waste disposal system in which uh, you know, we construct uh, three days a week a kind of alps of black plastic bags along the length of the street. I mean, this is we, we, are, in the the 20, we are in the 21st century in New York City, and this is how we dispose of so our So you want waste. to take back the streets literally? Yes. Now, obviously, we're not talking about political considerations. We're, we're talking about philosophy here. This, is, this ain't going to happen, is it? Well, there, there is a beginning. Um, you know, again, I think uh, Jeanette and, uh, and uh, Adrian Benepe, I mean, there, 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 there is some move um, to make greener streets. Mm -hmm. um, and the reconstruction of the streets would solve all sorts of problems. One, creates more public space, as I say. Um, we could begin to grow food, we can deal with uh, waste, we can deal with the transportation and bicycle storage, and we can also begin to deal with another of the great physical problems of the city, which is uh, the combined sewer system. Right. So, you, you, you know what that means, is that yes. the, the, you know, the, the, the so Go the, ahead, explain. That the, uh, I'm shivering. That, you know, you flush the toilet and uh, the contents go into the sewer. Um, it rains and the runoff goes into the same sewer. And what that means is, in effect, um, number one, that every time it rains, uh, the system is uh, taxed beyond its capacity. So we dump raw right, sewage. Right in, into the ocean. Into the river. Yeah, um, but it also means that... Uh, 
you know, many many books have been written in which uh, water shortages are identified as the the um, the petroleum crisis of the 21st century. It also means that um, we're not collecting this water; we're just wasting it. Uh, and uh, as you know, I'm I'm very committed to an idea of maximizing um, the literal autonomy of cities. So um, you know, one of the bedrocks of of local autonomy is water supply. So we are squandering um, billions of gallons of water that might be otherwise used to um, water the plants and uh, introduce a gray water mm -hmm. system into the city. This is a, a triple system in which uh, um, partially or, or, or largely remediated water is used for, not for drinking, but for toilet flushing, for watering the garden, right. for industrial uses, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, the reconstruction of the streets um, begs a whole series of, of issues for the uh, ecology of the city that we're not looking okay, at. Okay, let's, let's talk specifically. You mentioned the sort of the Times Square Broadway pedestrianization, if you will, that both Parks, Adrian Benepe, and trans, uh, Transportation, Jeanette Sadakhan have done. A success? Uh, I think absolutely. And, and expanded elsewhere? Where else does it go? Well, where else does it go? I, I, you know, the, 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 there is a fantasy that abroad, you know, among municipal Fantasize. officials, uh, which is that it goes all the way down Broadway, um, which, is, which is fine by me. Um, but it, it should go anywhere. I mean, again, again the kind of Manhattan-centric uh, approach is something right. that, you know, needs to be uh, interrogated. Uh, but, um, you know, there, there are neighborhoods all over the city that are begging for this, this kind of improvement. And I, I, I would say, parenthetically, or even centrally, uh, that I, I do believe that the neighborhood um, is, must, and will remain the essential framework um, for thinking about cities and urbanism. Um, and that if we um, um, uh, can kind of carry on with the speculation about how the city becomes more autonomous, right. I think one of the ways is that neighborhoods themselves become more autonomous. How? Well, let's take um, uh, transportation questions, Go for ahead. example. Um, one way that one can solve the, the, the problem of, of uh, excessive transport uh, is by eliminating the need for, for it. Not, not simply looking on the supply side, right. more subways, more buses, more demand. media, right. but look at the demand right. side. So if, if a neighborhood is something that you conceptualize as a place where all of your daily needs are met, which is to say living, employment, culture, commerce, recreation, right. um, then suddenly if you can walk to work as I do, a great privilege, um, and, and, you, and you a, reduce an extraordinarily the demand. small minority of the population can, af can afford to do this afford meaning many things yeah, both. But, but if we, if we ha distribute our, our, our social, technical, and physical infrastructure more astutely, um, you know, if we begin to locate places of work, um, not, not, not in, in the center of the city uh, uniquely, uh, right. but distributed in the neighborhoods, and if we, as has been called for by every bien pensant urbanist since the year Gimmel, uh, you know, begin to distribute to the residential mm -hmm. population. You know, the fastest growing residential uh, site in the city by on percentages is, is Lower Manhattan. Right. Um, and, you know, there are a variety of reasons for this, but this is, this is essentially, you know, a good thing that people will be living in proximity to their workplaces. Now, I, I don't think there should be any compulsion here, but if you take a view that um, in, in thinking about planning, you want to harmonize a mm -hmm. series of functions, uh, at the local level, which would include, as I say, this, this list of daily functions, might include waste remediation, uh, which can be dealt with locally rather than centrally. Um, you think about schools and, uh, you know, other, w which, are, which are already established as a kind of mm -hmm. basic neighborhood mm -hmm. bulwark. Then these more autonomous neighborhoods, um, I think, um, will um, uh, make a more equitable city, um, make a calmer city, and certainly make a more sustainable city. Okay, let's let's talk about sustainable and sustainability. What is the sustainability? We have an Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. What is sustainability? Just define it for me. Well, the, the standard definition is that um, one does not create any, any deficit for future generations. Okay. In, in, in terms of uh, what's available as planetary resources. And, and, and concretely, if you will? Well, um, 
let me answer slightly obliquely. Um, no, go ahead. You know, the, 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 the bottom line here is that um, we have only one planet for the time being. I was reading in the story in the Times about some famous physicist who's saying we better not colonize Mars because we'll bring our microbes and if there's any life there, it's had it. All of which is to we say... We don't have to worry about I, this. I, I, you and I, I, we don't have to worry about exactly. this. Exactly. I don't think that an extra planetary solution is no, about to come no, along. No, no, But the... The fact remains that if everybody on the planet, and you know, it's growing exponentially, we're six and a half billion, half of these are living in cities, half of those are living in slums. And an increasing number living in cities and slums. That's right, over half the population. Um, we add a million people to the urban population on the planet every week. Wow. A million people. Um, so, I mean, so another line might right. be the argument about the absolutely utter necessity of creating new cities for right. these people right. rather than the continuation of the megacity sprawl model. Um, so you must have done a lot of thinking about what these new cities might be. I mean, I have, you start... Let me finish, 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 finish. Let me finish, finish. my last point. So, 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 so the, so the, well, you're the professor, Go too. Ahead. Uh, no, the point is that um, six and a half billion people. So if all of these people were to consume at the rate that we do here, right. the surface area of an additional two planets would be required. I mean, this, this is simply to outline the extreme Ooh. nature of, of what is becoming a, a global crisis. Mm -hmm. So that means for me, um, uh, and my research is all, all about um, looking at sustainability as literally taking responsibility locally for all the forms of urban respiration. So as you know, we've been working for years on a, a study in my, my nonprofit uh, about um, how New York City can become completely self-sufficient yes. in everything yes. within its political boundaries. Right. And we're, we're well along. Um, you know, we've, we've demonstrated, I think, that we can do it with food, we can do it with water, we can do it with waste remediation, we can do it with um, the kind of thermodynamics of the city, we can do it with air quality. Um, and we're working on manufactured goods and building technologies and so on and so on and so on. And, and I think we will prove it. I mean, we may not be able to have the second cup of coffee. Uh, and uh, don't get me started about that chocolate bar. You may have to surrender. But um, as a technical matter, um, I think that we will be able to demonstrate so we're talking that... About that Go ahead. That, that we can literally take responsibility for our own inputs and outputs. So we have... Close the loop. We have technical feasibility. Then the question is, do we have political feasibility? Do we have the ability and will to do it? And that seems... Sure. That's problematic, And, and I, I don't know, frankly, at the end of the day, how, how rigorously I would make this argument. Uh, in terms of the permeability of the city and the necessity to spend whatever extra money it might cost to do this as opposed to importing energy supplies uh, from other sources. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what we want to do is to show that um, radical responsibility taking really is possible. Okay. You know, that we hold the solutions in our hands and if we have the will, we can solve them. And we're also, in effect, compiling a a morphological and technological encyclopedia that can be used should a city decide we want to supply half of our, our necessities or, or a quarter. So th th this is, in a sense, generalizable across the planet. Yes, it's not that, unique to any p p p p particular economic, social, or political system. This is potentially universal. Yes, and um, it's certainly in the sure. I mean, the, the the question of costs is 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 obviously at the center of this. Right. So you know what what we give ourselves as a limiter is that we only employ technologies that exist. Right. There's no anti gravity right. paint here. Right. Uh, and um, you know, and 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 assume that um, mass production is going to bring down the price of things. So that there is a, an increasing feasibility as as one goes on. I mean, take photovoltaics for example, which, uh, you know, the, the, the silver bullet for mm -hmm. lots of people. Still a bit expensive, right. but, you know, like computer chips uh, and everything else, right. it'll get cheaper. Right. So that's, right. a, that's a technology right. we, we assume we have available to us, um, as well as, um, you know, tidal energy and winds and geothermal energy and, uh, you know, the whole, the whole range of possibilities that presently exist on the planet. Okay. So we're looking at, at packages. Some of the things that I've noticed outrage you. We're going to go into the sort of the outrage seg segment of, of the program. We're going to do sort of a, I, I stream of consciousness. Yeah. Disneyfication and Times Square. You've got a minute screed. Huh? Well, um, 
Times Square, uh, you know, is, is, is a good place and a bad place. You know, I noticed when you sent me your notes, um, said something like, seems to have sentimental attraction to hookers, junkies, and... No, I have a sentimental attraction oh, to hookers, junkies, and pimps. Yeah. I don't know about you, but yeah. I sort of miss the grime, even though... All right. Well, here, Go here, ahead. Here, here's the point about Times Square, is that, um, number one, it becomes part of a very homogenized culture um, that is the culture of corporate globalization. You know, w one thing that we have come to learn, I think, you know, us academics and citizens as well, is that um, when one speaks of the public, um, one is in fact speaking of multiple publics. Um, and one of the appeals of the old Times Square was the intersection of, um, you know, an extremely raunchy public mm -hmm. uh, and an extremely proper public and the, you know... You and, don't have that now. And your mother going to the matinee, uh, you know. Right. And uh, she's avoiding Times Square. And she's avoiding Times Square. At, yeah. at great cost. Yeah. So, you know, there's an upside and a downside to that. But um, what um, the, the, the new Times Square has done in many ways is squeezed out that diversity and replaced it with this pre-digested cultural product. Um, McDonald's, you, Madame Tussauds. And, and, you know, and The Lion King, you know, all of which you can consume in Dubai or Singapore or Paris in exactly the same form. So to the degree that Times Square is something remarkably central to our sense of identity uh, and deeply indigenous to the idea of New York, and to the degree that all those things that are New Yorkish are being kind of squeezed out or recycled as New York and in inverted... Uh, commas, right. uh, I think it's a bad thing. On the other hand, uh, the closing of Times Square and the gathering of great crowds in the street is something beautiful and miraculous. Oh. So, you know, it's, it's, cut in, it's cut in both ways, oh. but it's a contested space. You know, there are publics that have a hard time there, and there are publics that have an easier time there, and that's part of the glory of the city is that it is the grounds of this kind of contestation and dispute. Oh, you love the... Okay. Fifteen seconds. Yeah. NYU, Columbia. What does it say about universities as neighbors? Um, well, yeah, I live I live near NYU, and they're they're, I, I, and, and I was at Columbia in the in in the day when they were making their incursion into Morningside uh, Park. Um, I, I don't know why these institutions have such tin ears. Um, why they think of themselves um, as. Um, um, not responsible to the fate of their immediate neighborhoods. You know, on the one hand, I mean, it, higher education is one of the best things we do. Thank and this, you. This is, this is, you know, I mean, particularly those of us who teach at public institutions, mm. you know, I, I think we are doing a remarkable service. Uh, but uh, that doesn't, uh, I think, relieve these institutions from more canny plans. I mean, in my, in my nonprofit, we've been doing a counterproposal to the Columbia scheme. And it's not to oppose the expansion of Columbia, which is very valuable. Rather, it's to say that if you think a little less imperially, you know, if you think that your campus need not be this contiguous bounded entity and think about a more disaggregated approach in which facilities are located uh, around communities that can profit from them, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this will be of, of greater benefit to the city. Oh. We have to stop. Ah. They're yelling at me. Yeah. We're way over, but that's fine. Yeah. So we're not finished with this conversation. We're going to have to continue with this tour at a later time. Okay. My thanks to Michael Sorkin for taking us on this tour of Manhattan and his observation of the city and city's life. See you next week. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.